उपकाय धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वूपिणे अवतार वरिष्ठा राम कृष्णा ते नम ओ वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगत गुरु so today we will just in the last class we have started that section where we find that lord is exemplifying in action in action in the process of creating the four varnas the four castes so what's the shloka that we uh, just started in the last class is the 13th shloka the 13th verse of the fourth chapter is chatur varnyam मैं सृष्ट गुणकर्म विभागश तस्तारमी मध्य कर्तारम अव्यय विधि अकर्तारम अव्यय सो इन द इलेवेन्थ वर्स वी हैव सीन दट वॉट्स लॉर्ड्स सेट दट ये यथा मां प्रपद्यंते तथा भजाम्यहम मम वर्तमानुवर्तंते मनुष्य पार्थ सर्वस so that by whatever way that men may worship me be it either possessed of desires or free from desires whatever the way in the same way i fulfill their desires by granting their desires so if we want the desires we want wealth we want position in life we want progeny so lord is there to help us in fulfilling our desires and if we want the emancipation the spiritual liberation for that also lord is there to help us so in the 13th shloka that which we just now read what is indicating that not to fulfill the desires what he has done he has created the four different varnas just the way when we go to the restaurant as per my choice as per my taste i have a varied of menu so these four varnas are like the menus as per our test we choose a particular varna which has nothing to do with our birth it has to do with our temperament as has been indicated by the word guna and karma that the four fold caste has been created by me chatur varnyam maya srishtam based on what based on the differentiation of guna and karma that some are sattvic by temperament some are rajasic by temperament समर तामसिक बाई टेम्परमेंट एंड वी नो दैट अ फोर कास्ट द ब्राह्मण्स आर दोज हु आर प्योर सात्विक बाई नेचर क्षत्रिय आर राजसिक विद प्री डॉमिनंस प्री पॉन्डरेंस ऑफ सत्व वैश्य आर दोज हु आर अगेन राजसिक विद द प्री पॉन्डरेंस ऑफ तमस एंड द शूद्र आर दोज हु आर प्री डॉमिनेंटली तामसिक so what actually it means that as in the last class also we are indicating that when you dwell only in the thought level just the academicians just the thought research as such they are not the ones who are converting transforming their thought into action they are just thinking that's the pure sattva be it in the a uh, process of meditation contemplation leading to the spiritual emancipation or even in any worldly pursuits if it's pure thought that has the sattva the brahmins and if there is that the head and the hand is linked that your thought process is leading to certain actions so that's the kshatriyas so they are creative like the government constantly they have to go on changing the laws amendments of the laws with uh, taking into consideration the situation the situational existence of the society it constantly is changing 
as per our uh, international borders are constant as per our international laws security laws are concerned constantly they have to contemplate they have to have a thought process based on which they are implementing certain actions so that is rajas with the preponderance of sattva and vaishyas they are rajasic they are doing lot of actions but those actions are mainly repetitive that the one who is doing agriculture this farming he doesn't have to think much from his four fast four fathers what the procedures they have followed he is following the same procedure at particular season he has to uh, sow the seeds and then plow the land irrigate the field everything is going on for generations so there is not much thought process involved in it so that's why it is called it is rajas lot of activity but with the preponderance of tamas as the thought process is not involved it is mainly repetitive action and the last the shudras who are these who are those those who are the, those who do some service oriented action they don't have to think at all what others are requesting what service they are in need you are providing that service so these are the, so that's why it is called preponderance of tamas where tamas means what actually is tamas the darkness why it is this where where you have thought process is not involved it is called darkness because uh, even in modern science they will say that our mind is not the tabula rosa swami vivekananda also indicated this word is not blank we are not born with a blank mind where education is something like pouring some information into an empty vessel it's not like that all the knowledge is within us all the knowledge how the knowledge develops when the child opens his eyes sees the red flower no one has to teach him that what's the redness is it was there all the color smell you just give the words to indicate that particular perception what we are giving is the language but the knowledge is already there all the knowledge if the knowledge was not there it was impossible to teach the children so the knowledge is already there we what is, what that unless that knowledge is illumined it is tamas it is hidden in darkness so all this the idea of that uh, in our scriptures this is the tanmatras the panchabhutas are tamas and we generally think that external world this matter is tamas it actually doesn't mean that way that before the perception has happened idea of all the objects is there in the mind the idea of this table is there in my mind the moment i perceive that idea gets illumined so that's why tamas gets converted into sattva so those who don't use that faculty the ideas are still there always in darkness they are just resorting to some actions which doesn't need to illumine their mind they go on doing repetitive actions like the vaishyas or do service oriented actions which are purely tamasic like the shudras so it depends on the temperament so some people by nature are reflective some want to tinker means there are thinkers and the tinkerers the thinkers are the one who are the purely the brahmins the tinkers are converting their knowledge into some action so they're tinkering with their knowledge and then the repetitive actions are the vaishyas and the shudras are the one who are doing service oriented action the thought process is not involved at all so as per the temperament these are the cry these are the various varnas which you will find universally in all the society it's not that only in our society which society doesn't have this is the four class you won't you can categorize all the professions within this four class in any society and that's what bhagwan is saying yes in india it's an evil that the thing which bhagwan is indicating that it is based on guna and karma that became based on janma that is never mentioned it happened so if you remove that evil then you will find that this is a system which is there everywhere in every society so that's the thing which bhagwan is indicating so based on our temperament our predos predisposition we can choose our varna and god has divided he has created that four varnas so what he is saying that as per the people's 
temperament, their predisposition. I have created, it is he who has created this four varnas. And tasya kartaram apivam, that I am the one who have created. The karta in the sense of creation, the first word. But what vidhi akartaram avayam. But know me, though I have created them, but know it for certain that I am not the doer. I am the changeless one. Avyayam, that who has no change. For us, the external uh, stimuli is constantly making us react. And reaction speaks of change. Constantly we are changing. Our attitude is changing. Our behavior is changing. Based on our attitude, we are resorting to some action. So this constant change is going on. But the Lord is just the witness sitting there. He has created, but he is not the karta. Now it is sometimes very difficult to understand that he has created, but he is not the karta. What actually it means? So I will give you an example. It's a very you can you can all relate to it. Uh, the founder of the Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. He has founded the Facebook, and now the Facebook is such a social media where you will find. It can be used by all the forecasts. The academicians are using it for spreading knowledge. You can just like this like this class. After the class we record, we post it in the Facebook, in the YouTube, whatever it is, and it is viewed by those who really are of the same temperament. So it's used by the academicians. It can be used by the business person. You will find that so many trades are going on there, isn't it, in the Facebook. That things are promoted. You can sell things, buy things to the various this, uh, this apps, Facebook and other apps. And what all uh, this uh, the politicians can use it for propaganda. You will find. So now suppose you think that some because of some propaganda, there is a tremendous unrest in the society. And nowadays we will find that people are blaming the social media just the way. When uh, in, we don't find any solution to the problems of our life, we blame God. We say, after all, he has created. Can we really blame uh, Mark Zuckerberg for the social, this all the propaganda and based on the propaganda? Like in uh, last year, uh, in Bangladesh it happened, you all know very well, that during the Durga Puja, someone kept the Quran on the feet of the Ganesha in one of the... Uh, Pandals. And there was a huge riot, almost like riot. All the images were broken. And then we find that they were saying that this social media nowadays has created all these issues. When you are getting all the benefits out of it, nobody says it's bad. When something happens, unrest happens. But is it really the social media who is responsible for that? Based on our guna, karma, based on our temperaments, what we are doing with that app, for that we are getting the result. But is the Mark Zuckerberg, you can say the karta, for that all the things which are happening, all the riots which are happening, is not the karta. So now you can understand the same thing. Based on our guna and karma, God has created these forecasts. So he's the creator. But he is in no way the doer. Now based on all those forecasts, the beings who are under the bond, this bondage of ignorance, they, as per their desires, following the Swadharma, they are acting based on uh, that uh, forecast which has been divided. But the Lord is not the doer. So as Sri Ramakrishna, very in simple words, he says, the same sunlight a, in which uh, a person, a holy person, may be reading the scriptures. And some other person with some evil tendency, most probably is counterfeiting the coins, is making some counterfeited coins. Can we praise the sunlight or blame the sunlight? No, it is just, its duty is just to give this light. So what we are doing with it, for that we are responsible. So God in no way is the doer. He's the, he has created, but after that, he's in no way the doer of the actions. We cannot hold him responsible for the things which are going on. For this, we, as per our temperaments, are acting and yielding the result. The Lord, as such, is just the witness. So that's what the idea is. Now you will find that it becomes clear. This Chatur Varnyam, Maya Srishtam, he has created these four varnas, Guna, Karma, Vivhavasha. 
as per our temperaments, as per our predispositions. Tasya kartaram apya mom. Though I am the creator, though I am the author thereof, vidhi akartaram apya. Know me to be the non-doer, the changeless. Changeless means I am just the witness. After creating, I am just witnessing what's going on. In no way, I am the agent of all the things which are happening. So now, after saying this, what implication it has in our life? I know that Lord is the one who is the changeless reality, is the witness. So this knowledge, the knowledge, does it has any implication in our life? Has it any purpose in our life? So that he will be speaking of in the next verse. So what he's saying? Namang karmani limpanti. The 14th verse of the 4th chapter. Namang karmani limpanti. Name karma phale spriha. Iti maam yo bhi janati karma bhir nasa badhyate. So once you are aware of the fact that the Lord is not having any sense of agency, that I am the doer, that he is not the agent of the action, he is not the doer of the action. When you know that, then what happens? That The actions do not taint the Lord. Even as we say in a different way, that it is the self which has been projected as the universe. It is the Brahman which is projected as the universe. And when it is projected, it is in no way affecting the ultimate reality. Just the way when you see the snake on a rope, does the snake has the capacity, that snake has the capacity to bite the rope, to inflict poison on that rope? No. It is just a mere projection. How can it inflict poison in that rope? When you see the mirage, does that huge reservoir, you see the huge reservoir you see, can it drench even a single sand particle on which it is projected? That into a huge mirage is projected beyond in, on the desert, the desert is the substratum. Does it have the capacity to drench even a sand per single sand particle? No. So that's the idea. It's a projection. So it doesn't have the capacity to affect the reality on which it is projected in any way to any trust. So that's the idea. Namang karmani limpanti. Nave karma phale spriya. Action do not taint me, nor do I have any thirst for the result of action. Iti maam, what is the implication, what is the uh, benefit which we get out of this knowledge. Iti maam yo bhi janati karma bhir nasabadhyate. He who knows me thus is not fettered by action. After all, who is, the, who is God? He is not extraterrestrial sitting somewhere outside this universe. He is the Kshetragya, sitting in our heart. And he is saying that I am in no way the doer of action. What it means? The my essence, the essence of my being, the Paramatma, the self of the self, is the Lord himself who is not the doer of action. That means I am not the doer of action. I am not the doer of action. Because the essence of me is the Lord. So if I know that the Lord is not the doer, that implies that in all my actions, my body-mind complex, because of its nature, prakriti, guna guneshu vartanta, it is interacting with the, the senses are interacting with the sense objects, creating all this uh, network of activities. But the real me is just the witness. As per the position of life, as we have been born, as per our tendencies, we have been born in a particular situation in life or we have chosen particular profession. We seek not, avoid not. We go through that. We take that responsibility, go through that process, but with the sense of that detachment. But the body-mind has to go through this. A past impulse has resulted in this body. It has to go through all these experiences, whether it is pleasant, whether it is unpleasant, it is the body-mind which is going through it. I am the self, just the witness. So this is the idea which becomes ingrained in the person who is aware of the working of the Lord. The way the Lord is working, that becomes internalized. Not only internalized, it's actually already internalized. I just become aware of it. 
and that enables me not to get attached to the actions which I am doing. So karma bhir na padhyate. So you develop that attitude of a witness. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say when he was suffering from cancer, anyone is to ask, how are you sir? So, shorir tar dukkho jane, maun tumi anande thako. The body knows its suffering. Oh mind, if you are dwelling in the self, then you are always in bliss. So it's up to us where we keep our mind. So if we keep our mind in the Lord, it is bliss and bliss alone. If we attach it to this worldly way of living, then we will be just dancing around with the dualities of life. Sometimes when there is joy, full of joy, we are ecstatic. And then again, like a pendulum, we are swinging. We go to the depression. Whenever those factors which contribute to our happiness has gone. So we will be just fluctuating. But so there, is, there is a state which is beyond these joys and sorrows. As that examples which we give again and again. You know that the, the fishermen with the small boats in India, we see in the Puri, they call the Nulis. They're very small boat. With a small boat, they're extremely capable. They can go into the deep ocean for fishing. They're very poor men. With a small boat, they go for fishing in the deep waters. But if you watch, you will see an interesting thing. It's not in one attempt they can go. Because there are the waves, waves after waves. So one huge wave comes, they're trying to sail into the deep waters, a huge wave comes and just throws them again to the shore. Again they try. They go on trying again and again and again, and at last they succeed. They go to, because this, you know, the waves are just in the, near the uh, shore. If you go to the deep waters, a little into the deep waters, the ocean is calm. So once they break these wave barriers, these wave barriers, once they break, they can break it. They are in the silent waters. They are just fishing in the calm water. So that's what our sadhana is. That our mind in the surface of the existence, it's actually all calm within. Our real existence is like the ocean. It is eternal, calm. It's ex there is no ex end to its expanse. It is infinite. And in shore of existence, this worldly existence is just in the shore of it. There are all the waves in the form of our thoughts, our desires. It's all just in the shore. The door deep we go, in the, in the core of our being, it is all calm, infinite ocean, calm. There's only in the shore, these barriers are there. Our entire sadhana is just like those nulis, the small fit this boat of the fishermen, with which we are trying to cross the barriers but once we can cross, we are in that infinite expanse of ocean, that calm ocean, that's a real being. So that's the thing. So as we have we, are, we have to endeavor on. So how to go beyond that, not to get attached with this so-called, the waves become more big, huge, the more our identification is with the sense objects. The more we can identify with the self, the more we can develop the capacity to cross these barriers and go into the deep ocean. So that's the idea which here is being indicated here. So once you are aware of the way the Lord is working, you become aware of the core of your being and that results in that detachment which takes you to the, the what is the core of your existence. So as Sri Ramakrishna used to give the example of the green coconut and the ripened coconut. That what that when you break these uh, barriers of waves, the wave barrier you break, what has happened? You have become like a ripened coconut, where the core, the, the coconut, when the coconut is green, it is unripe. You you can if you you cannot separate the kernel from the shell. The shell and the kernel are intertwined. And when it is ripe, you just shake the coconut, you find something is moving inside. The shell has got separated from the kernel. So you know you are the self. You are always in inaction, akarta, akarta, inactive. But all the activities are going on in the shore, in the body-mind complex, and you are just the witness of it. You are in no way involved in it. So just like the Lord, if one can develop the detachment, 
by knowing that he or she is akarta then actions cannot bind him anymore so he becomes like that ripened coconut where he knows that the self is in no way associated with the body mind complex the shell and the kernel has got separated so that's the idea which has been spoken of in the 14th verse so the same idea is being repeated again when it's being uh, summarized in the 15th verse what is he saying bhagwan is saying evam gyatva kritam karma purvairapi mumukshubhi kuru karmaiva tasmatvam purvai purvataram kritam so we will find this idea bhagwan in summary always says that in the previous uh, in, for ages together there are many who has become detached who has been liberated by following this process why is saying again and again this just to convince arjuna that it is not something that to inspire you to take part in the war that he he want to retreat so now krishna is trying his best to inspire him so that he takes part in this war of righteousness and just to do that he is trying to brainwash him no he is not trying to just change his mind in a self styled way he is saying it is a very very old uh, well experimented trodden path so many have just traverse through this path and have went to that state of liberation so evam gyatva so knowing thus the ancient seekers after spiritual freedom also performed action the mumukshu the ancient spiritual seeker the purvairapi mumukshu bhi the aspirants the spiritual seekers in the past purvairapi so they also followed the same procedure the same modus operandi that the ancient seekers after spiritual freedom they also have performed action with this detachment so knowing this you also therefore perform action alone as did the ancient in the olden times so we will find that lokamanya bal ganga dhatilak in his commentary of bhagavad gita uh, we don't know from where he has quoted a sloka a wonderful sloka he has quoted <coughs> but speaks of the uh, this sanam this, this summary of this idea of uh, detachment in action what he is saying viveki sarvatha mukto the one who has that discrimination between the real and the unreal he is always liberated even while living he is free this is a wonderful concept in vedanta everywhere we find in all religions in all dualistic religions even in hinduism the dualistic religions they keep liberation in future that if you lead a life in a particular way by resigning to the divine then after death you go somewhere you go somewhere where you live eternally in association with the divine in eternal happiness and eternal bliss so it is something post mortem existence this liberation is something after death but in vedanta this idea is wonderful that idea of jivan mukta the enjoyment of the bliss of freedom in this body even while living as shankaracharya in vivek churamani very nicely he has described it what is the purpose of human birth jivan mukti sukha prapti hetave janma dharana the only purpose of this human birth is to enjoy the bliss of liberation even while living so that's the beauty of vedanta eh eh what is here and now not something post mortem so that's the thing viveki sarvatha mukta always the moment you have developed the discrimination you are free even in this body you are free kurvata nasti kartrita because it has no sense of the karta the sense of doer that has fallen off he knows the body mind complex as per its past impulse has been placed in a particular situation in life and it is going through its action but the self behind is just the witness is in no way identified that with that is in no way the doer of all those things so 
kurvato nasti kartri so he doesn't have the sense of kartri that the sense of doer being he being the viveki alepa vadam see the words are so wonderful alepa to smear something is lepa you smear something uh, on your skin or anywhere so that is lepa so alepa vad unsmeared so what it means it means non attachment nothing can smear you nothing can touch you <clears throat> so alepa vadam asritya by resorting to this philosophy of detachment alepa vad this word is so beautiful alepa vadam asritya shri krishna janako yatha so they are the role models shri krishna the janaka they are the role models they have shown us that way of life that how just to live in this world and enjoy the bliss of freedom it's not that you have to uh, have some surgery that i have to separate myself from the world no you are you are in the world outwardly you are look you look just to be like any worldly person so now it is spirituality is identified with certain state that uh, previously it was the three dandis they will have some uh, stick in their hand marks and then it sounds very spiritual and now it is of course spirituality has uh, that marks have changed still more you will be sitting on some huge throne and you will be uh, working on some walking on some ramp with thousands of devotees you are spiritual those are not spirituality as sri ramakrishna used to say the paramahamsa that when in dakshineshwar they used to come in search of the paramahamsa people have heard there is paramahamsa stays and they come and they don't find because he is just a person wearing just the cloth like us the dhoti that also a white dhoti and that also is above the knee sometimes he is working in the garden and people come and ask him we have heard there is a paramahamsa okay, do you know where is the paramahamsa and he used to say very nice thing that what do you think that the paramahamsa will have two horns so that you can identify him he is just like an us in appearance everywhere he is just like an ordinary being his total mental orientation has changed just very nice that there is a very nice way of saying it that sadhu hobe sadhu sajbe na be a holy person don't pretend to be a holy person and sanshari sajbe sanshari hobe na pretend to be householder don't become a householder but we just become the opposite we always uh, pretend to be a very religious person but we are extremely attached householders even as swamis we can be householders if we are attached so this is the idea which we find again and again repeated in the bhagavad gita that it doesn't that there are certain marks uh, certain uh, change in your external uh, appearance that in has nothing to do with spirituality it speaks of the change of the total inner orientation and that's the idea which we find so evam gyatva kritam karma kurvai rapi moksha in the past the aspirants have followed the same path of alepa vad ale so kuru karmaiva tasmatvam purvai purvataram kritam so you also follow that tradition that follow that parampara follow that lineage and that will take you to that ultimate spiritual fulfillment because it is a time tested path it is something which has been patented you can say and for to patent anything it has to be experimented not only with one person with a group of person with hundreds you know that medicine is patented that way that when we say the medicine is effective when it has been experimented with hundreds of cases and in we found that in 99% cases it is working if someone says i have seen god and no one else can see it that is not patented what has it has to do with my life if krishna has shown a way of life that we couldn't follow why would we follow krishna there is no need he can be worshiped but we can, that worship has no meaning if i cannot really have implement the things which he has exemplified through his life so that is the ahangraha his words are wonderful that he is not just a vigraha if the vigraha can really be a vigraha if that vigraha helps in 
transforming life, my life. The vigraha can become ahangraha. I can internalize all the things which represents that vigraha that is internalized. Otherwise, just I can I just resort to a, all sorts of licentious things in life and just go and just say, "Oh God, forgive me. You are great." You forgive. That type of religion has nothing to do with the transformation of our life. It may, to a certain extent. Uh, give you some uh, some release your psychological pressure to a certain extent. But there it ends. It in no way transforms your life. We go on repeatedly doing mistake and just go and say, just Lord, pardon me, forgive me. So real for the forgiveness is what? The one the, who has really repents is what? That he won't repeat it. He has understood that this is a wrong way. Repentation, repentance means that, that if it is a wrong way, I was not aware my previous mental uh, uh, state of mind never allowed me to understand that I am following the wrong way. Most of the time, knowingly we never do wrong. That we are in such a state where we think what we are doing is correct and we evolve and then we understand that was not correct and then the repentance come and then we say that we won't do it anymore. And then we start following that life. So this internalization is very important and for that internalization, Bhagavan is showing the example from his own life. His own life is the commentary. So that is the thing which has been indicated in these three slokas. So with this, with the idea that though uh, he has created this awareness, but in no way he is the doer, he is exemplifying how we should live in this life so that we can also enjoy the bliss of liberation. So now, after saying that, the question comes, whenever the action, when any action, the question of action comes, we will find that in our life, always we are in dilemma. Sometimes we are in a junction, uh, in such a junction where we cannot decide whether to act or not to act. Or, or my actions is something which is forbidden, which is not uh, going to benefit anyone, neither me nor the others. It is something uh, which is unlawful. So, akarma, karma, and vikarma. Akarma means in action, karma means action, vikarma means forbidden actions. So, these things, things will be described from the 16th to the 23rd verse of Bhagavad Gita in the 4th chapter. So, let us go to the idea of action, inaction, and forbidden action as it starts in the 16th verse of the 4th chapter. What it is saying? Kim karma kim akarmeti kim karma kim akarma iti kavayo pyatra mohitaha kavayo pyatra kavayo api atra mohita kavayo pyatra mohita tatte karma pravakshyami yaj gyatva moksha se ashubhat that even the intelligent person, they also get deluded, confounded that what is action and what is inaction, whether to act or not to act. So therefore I will tell you clearly of action by knowing which you will become freed from evil. Tatte karma pravakshami. So I will teach you the methodologies of action, the intricacies of action, karma. Knowing which, yat gyatva, yaj gyatva, moksha se, you get, you get freed from what? From ashubha, from evil. So now he will start. So we will find that why Bhagavan is starting uh, this discussion? Because the Bhagavad Gita started with this idea actually. Arjuna thinking the war to be something which results in hingsa. And scripture says, ahingsa paramo dharma. Non-violence is the supreme dharma, supreme righteousness. So the scripture says that. And now there is a war. This war which is going to result in tremendous violence. And Arjuna feels that I should retreat. I don't want to take part in this hingsa. So now you will find the dilemma. Already he is in dilemma. The whether, whether to do or not to do. So this ahimsa, this, the principles of dharma, we find are really subtle that way. That's, that's sometimes in our life, we are in that 
position where scripture is saying something but I find that if I follow the scriptures yes uh, following the scriptures of course is a mode of action but it doesn't enter in the real righteousness as we were saying that all the principles are made all the principles are made based on what based on some laws so actually this is opposite. all the laws are made based on some principle what's the principle everywhere the ultimate principle is ahimsa means in i have to lead the life in such a way that my interest is doesn't at uh, what is trample over others interest that's the basic dharma everywhere just as very nicely it has been uh, told in our shastras in mahabharata that is very simple line paropakara punyaya papaya para pirana so whenever you are reaching out to help others that is punya and whenever you are causing others pira causing others suffering that is papa so whenever you forget yourself after all enter spiritual journey is to attenuate the ego is to forget the self and the best way is to by thinking of others so by that's the first step say boy as we in the last class all we are saying this young person who doesn't have he is not a family person who is earning and he feels that that impulse is there today let me go to this restaurant have food today let me go and uh, enjoy have some entertainment nothing restricts him and when he enters into a family life and now you will find we say that family life is for enjoyment no it is actually just the opposite it is meant for renunciation the moment you enter into the family life the same person who thought that to live freely is the way of life now you will find no one has to teach him the moment he thinks of going to that restaurant to enjoy the dish immediately the thought of his own children of his wife is bound to come to his, uh, in his mind if he is a real responsible person and what naturally that renunciation will come he will what he will do he will go that buy the things go home share with all so the self has now extended to his family so this renunciation it's something very natural it comes naturally with the sense with with your with your so called the family life and everywhere that it's uh, if anyone says that only the sannyasis have renunciation no sometimes you will find it's just the opposite even sannyasis after leaving anything everything if they cannot keep their mind in god they become too attached to their body itself a little sickness will make them perturbed because as they couldn't hold on to god they thought of holding on to god they couldn't and now something the mind has to hold on and he doesn't have family he becomes extremely self concerned so sometimes we will find a family person is better than that he is at least concerned with the other family members he give importance to that so renunciation is something which is basic thing in life so what we were saying that all the laws are based on that principle but with the uh, passage of time we will find that we as a human have a tremendous uh, wonderful capacity to bend those laws in such a way and that by which the principle is compromised the entire legal system will really is doing that the law has been made what it is meant for really uh, serving the people but sometimes you will find if you have money you can use the law to exploit others it's a common thing for ages to where this is going on so so now you you really find very difficult and when the, as the society becomes more and more complex in a particular situation that what's lawful what's unlawful what's whether to uh, to resort to action or not to resort has become so complex so in this situation taking con- into consideration this situation this bhagwan is saying that especially for arjun in this context we find that he is thinking of retreating so he is in this context bhagwan is saying that yes you should know the principles of action if you really want to go beyond the evils if you want to get liberated from the evils so what is karma what is akarma what is vikarma that again he will be stating in the next verse the 17 what is saying karmano yapi 
he api this shandhi uh, this lot of shandhis in gita this he api means he api karmano he api bodhavyam so you have to know what is karma bodhavyamcha vikarmana you have to also know what is forbidden action akarmanascha bodhavyam and what is inaction that also you have to know gahana karmano gati the way of action is really very very intricate so let us read the next verse and then these two verses we will try to just try to uh, uh, elaborate it to find its real meaning so what is the next verse saying karmanya karma this is a very famous verse karmanya karma karmani akarma ya pashyat the one who sees action in inaction karmani uh, karmani akarma ya pashyat who says uh, inaction inaction and pashyat karmani cha karma ya and who sees action uh, this inaction inaction action in inaction and inaction in action okay so it appears to be bit uh, tricky as if something like puzzle but it's something very simple they're saying the one who sees action in inaction and inaction in action sa buddhiman manushyasu so among the human beings among the human kind he is the buddhiman he is the wise person sa yukta he is the one who is yukta who is a yogi who is always in union always in association identified with the divine yukta krishna karma krit and he is the master of all actions so now let us try to understand what bhagwan is saying that first he told that you should know what is karma akarma and vikarma and now he is saying that if you know that uh, to see the inaction in action and action in inaction then you are the most wise the most intelligent person and you can you you are the master of all actions means the act you are not the slave of actions you are the master of actions you know our life we find that we are the, almost the slave our sense of responsibility forces us to act in a particular way we don't feel that i am free uh the actions are following as per the situation of life but it in no way binds me we never feel so what and uh, the idea is that what is karma akarma and vikarma now in the context of arjuna we find that he wanted to resort to akarma he want to he doesn't want to take part in the war he wants to retreat so that's what happens with most of us we think that if the self is beyond action why should i resort to action that by Uh, bhagwan is saying that you have to do action without any motive without any attachment the question comes why should i resort to action at all because if i do if i am resorting to action then only the question of attachment to action comes so why not simply renounce the action and then all the problem is solved it is just like as our sri dharan ji again and again gives says that gives that uh, example it is just like throwing the baby along with the uh, water that uh, uh, in the tub the tub water in which they were supposed to bathe the baby so you are throwing the baby along with the tub water so swami vivekananda in uh, one of his lecture is a lecture on isha upanishad god in everything there at the very beginning he gives this gives another this example which speaks of that uh, the same thing which Uh, 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 our that Sri Dharanji's example says of what is that? That a king was just taking rest, was lying, was sleeping, and he had a monkey as his own servant. The monkey was there to serve the king, and the <clears throat> king, before going to sleep, told the monkey, "Just see the flies don't disturb me. There will be some flies disturbing me." so whenever the fly was coming and sitting on the body of the king the monkey was trying to drive it away at last it got frustrated because the more it drives it away again it comes then at last the monkey sat with a sword he got the king's sword and he was sitting with that and the moment the fly sat and he immediately stri- strike the sword the f- of course the fly flew off so what has happened you couldn't understand so that's what 
Swamiji is saying happens with most of us, thinking that actions like the fly is disturbing us, we try to kill it with the sword and we kill ourselves at last. So that is the thing which Bhagavan will be indicating, that we think that let us resort to inaction. But can we resort to inaction? That's the thing where the various reasons which Bhagavan throughout the Gita have shown that inaction is not possible as such. That by inaction we may just think that I, I, I won't uh, resort to any type of action, sit quietly. But when, even when you are sitting quietly, you are cons- whether you want it or not, you are breathing, your mind is active, your heart is beating. So the nature is such, it won't allow you to stay even for a moment without action. Just to sustain yourself, the activity has to go on. So that's the sloka which I have already studied. The fifth sloka of the third chapter. That nahi kaschit kshanamapi jatu tishthati akarmakrit. That even for a moment, we cannot stay inactive. Karyate yavasha karma sarva prakriti jair gunai. The nature is such that even for sharira yatra, even just for our existence, we have to resort to action. So in action, that way is not possible. The second reason in action is possible is related to vikarma. That most of the time we will find that thinking that I don't want to be in the turmoil of action, I uh, retreat and I think just by being inactive, I will be poised in the self. And we find that's the time where the empty mind Empty mind proves to be the devil's workshop. And from there all the vikarma starts. So when you are not active, a karma can result, can in, can, what to say can, in most of the cases, the one who is not an illumined soul, it is going to result in vikarma. When, the, when you are keeping your mind unengaged from any activity, then all these evil thoughts are bound to come. Because the mind cannot stay in one place. Either you have to pump it to rise high or it will fall below. Just like water. The water's natural tendency is to go down. Mind's natural tendency is to go down. Unless you are pumping it up through some uh, constructive activities, good thoughts, good activities, you are pumping it up. It is bound to go down. Uh, to give an example, you know in the 60s and the 70s, 1960s and 70s, because of the affluence of the European societies, Tremendous affluence was there. And there, even if you don't work, you get from the government, the welfare society. Those who are not working, so they get some dole from the government. The, you, you get some uh, uh, remuneration from the government. Monthly. So people's tendency was not to work, if I can get some money. And then with the total laser, a type of meaninglessness develops. And then suddenly it became a something viral uh, social uh, f- uh, evil. What's that? At the dead of night, they will move out. This young brand will move out. They started breaking this, you know, the, the glass cases of the showrooms without any reason. That life is meaningless. Why all this pamp and glory? Uh, that uh, after all, the life is so boring. What to do with life? They, were, they went to the destructive mode, breaking all this. Even recently it happened. Uh, last year in Germany it happened. Suddenly some a group of boys went and was uh, breaking without any reason at all. And you know what, the, uh, at that time, the, the government, uh, the policy they took, very interesting policy, that we won't allow a, a, anyone to sit idle. Some sort of work have to be involved. They have to be involved. That even, uh, 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 what you say, we don't need so many products. Just say the luxury products, the soap, I don't need. Sufficient amount is there. The good brands are there. But they started producing all those things as a voluntary activity and the, all were uh, bound to be involved on in those activities. And those things, they don't want. This affluent society, they were sending to the African countries. They were needing all those things. Why? Because if you keep some of these people free, that the government has sufficient money, they can provide you, they're the welfare state. And that way, that laser is something was quite acceptable. It's okay. The nation can uh, provide you. Of course, there is a short-term politics in that also. That way the entire nation, instead of being dependent on the family, starts depending on the state. 
you will find that's one of the big problem in the present modern society that they don't <laughs> depend on the family where well, just a little they, they grow up they know the state takes care of them state takes care of them and that creates so many issues so many issues uh, <clears throat> even in recent greece uh, in the last 10 years back you know when now when you provide the uh, state with all uh, that what are the requirements whether you are working or not working now the european union the all the countries were not same uh, same way producing resource germany is producing a lot of resource and then that the entire european union was u- utilizing and you will find in the greece in italy there was a lot of agitation why because there there was a recession in the economy uh, as they were not producing like the other european countries there was a recession in the economy the other countries told like germany told that i cannot uh, just simply give the money to some nation who are spending most of their time in the sea beach just spending their time there why should uh, the resource which i generate i am going to give them so there was some uh, uh, what you say this uh, recession or uh, means dissension within that uh, uh, european union and now naturally the economy of some of the countries which were not really producing they started falling and now the people have developed the idea government is there to provide and they went for you know that riot mass agitation <coughs> destruction so that's 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 what happened and if it is a family oriented where the family is controlling the children when you are bringing up not the that speaks of totally different thing you know in uganda uh, uganda when that's in the time of idi amin when it was decided in 40 48 hours all the indians has to leave the country they they the uk that time declared that uh, we will give their uh, the, them refuge refugee means that as a refugee they went there they will give them the shelter and in 20 years in just 20 years from that group the maximum number of multi millionaires in uk have come up from that group why the same condition they had uh, no resources they were uh, in dire poverty but the mother was there the family head she was deciding how much resource she can share with all and all accepted that this family integrity is something like that when the government says our resource has gone come down let me just try to uh, uh, what you say uh, bring down your salaries no more increments there is a huge agitation but in the family the mother can the mother is a tremendous power she can do that wonderfully so there are so many evil effects what we were saying is this that somehow because of affluence when that akarma comes our mind is such it won't allow us to just simply enjoy that laser we will go to that destructive mode do all sorts of forbidden action the drug addiction everything can comes from that akarma when uh, you are not sufficiently engaged in some productive action so akarma can result in vikarma in your own life again in others life also akarma can result in vikarma when you just keep yourself your mouth shut even seeing the improper things going on in the society your akarma can result in vikarma you will find that the what is the cause of the entire mahabharat war when dropadi was forcibly brought to the the king's uh, this court and this hooligans the uh, the kauravas they were trying to disrobe her all the seniors were silently sitting there akarma was resulting in vikarma isn't it so akar with this vik this that's why gogan is saying that these are very much linked akarma as such you cannot really practice akarma and then first it is going to uh, result in vikarma in your own life and even if you are not doing something you are maintaining a passive goodness it is going to bring some evil in the society others get the inspiration to just simply uh, uh, go on uh, in a total uh, what you say that destructive mode destroying because no one is there to uh, oppose them restrict them so that happened we find even when draupadi asks that what is dharma to bhishma a character like bhishma that she he is saying that the ways of dharma is so subtle i don't know i cannot decide so this again that your akarma can result in vikarma in the society so that's akarma and vikarma is linked and then again 
this the, there's a notion i act generates the ego that uh, after all uh, what is liberation in the words of ramakrishna ami mukto hobo kavenshan i be free the ultimate criteria for liberation is when i cease to be that is sense that i am this limited individuality now when i am resorting to action of course it comes from the ego but when you say i won't resort to action from where it is coming again from the ego it is the ego your own ego which is saying i don't want to resort to action so it is the same so in that way you are crystallizing your ego in the name of akarma it is not leading you to uh, liberation it is actually crystallizing your ego i won't act and again most of the time you will find inaction is also a type of seeking we say action is seeking but inaction is also seeking how most of the time that i oh i will leave my job enough uh, whatever i have earned with that i can spend less of my life and you will think oh i have renouncing it's not renunciation you will find actually you cannot face the challenges of your job you are seeking comfort zone you are seeking security zone so it is also a type of seeking it is not it is not really from the dispassion your inaction has resulted so that's how you will find that inaction as such is not something which is going to liberate me unless it has some spiritual intonation set in it so that's what bhagwan is indicating that akarma as such doesn't mean spiritual uh, what you say state of spiritual evolution it doesn't speak and to experience then then what is the way there is a way is to experience in action in action so that we will elaborate again in the next class the idea is that we have already spoken of that let the body mind complex go on through its activities as we were told as per the guna as per the karma we have been born in with particular tendencies which enabled us to choose a particular way of life particular profession particular uh, uh what you say that family ashrama you may be grihastha sanyasi all this your dispositions have uh forced you to choose has enabled you to choose now based on that the body mind complex has to go on through some activities in that situation and whatever activities is going on if the body is going inactive but if you are always aware that i am the self i am just with, uh, witnessing it then you are a, actually experiencing inaction in action the action is going on but the self is always akar that's akarma that it is inactive it is never working it is always in its own calmness that the body mind complex is working it is always at peace with himself so that's the only way we can experience akarma in action the so akarmani in karma and karma in uh, akarma what is it and when i'm sitting inactively there a lot of activity is going on my mind is active my body's activity is going on and i will find that what uh, there's uh, this uh, um, the mind is constantly resorting to sankalpa and vikalpa so though apparently it appears that i am uh, actionless but my mind is extremely active lot of activity is going on so the one who has known this so what he will do he will resort to action trying to always keep his identification with the self alone and as a witness he goes through the process of life seeking not avoiding not so that's the idea basic idea so we will elaborate a bit more on this the second this phase of this life that the one who sees action in inaction and uh, inaction in action he is the buddhiman he is the wise he can go beyond the evils on this again we will just from this we will start and continue for till 23rd shloka of this chapter deals with this the distinction between karma akarma and vikarma and how to uh, see action in inaction in action action this idea will be more and more elaborate till 23rd verse so we will continue with this discussion again in the next class so with this we stop our discussion today thank you all namaskaras